Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Cease Friday webinar. Um, we will begin now. I wanted to remind you that um, your video cameras and microphones have been disabled, but we would appreciate if you would submit questions with the Q&A function either during or at the end of the presentation, and we will answer questions as time permits at the end. And as a reminder to those of you who need it, we have live captioning for the duration of the event. Of course, remember that this is not always accurate, but we found it to be useful should you need to have closed captioning available. For today's um, webinar, we'd like to thank our University of Michigan co-sponsors, Science, Technology, and Society program, Medieval and er Early Modern Studies. Of course, the International Institute is a great partner, as is the Department of Asian Languages and Culture. So we welcome people from there today. And we, of course, would not be able to do any of this without funding from the United States Department of Educational National Resource Center grant. Um, so we acknowledge their support. Uh, just a quick note, um, we wanted to thank everybody who's participated this semester in our webinars, submitted questions, presented, or even just attended. It's been a really nice way for us to keep in contact and um, keep the center a little bit of spirit and camaraderie. We will come out with our final schedule for the winter semester um, shortly, but we did wanna highlight that one of our own faculty, Scott Sonington, will present on January 29th at noon on his new book, The Spirit Ambulance, Choreographing the End of Life in Thailand. And I know any of you who have heard Scott talk, it's just a fascinating um, topic and he's a great speaker. So we hope to see you all there. And with that, I'm really excited to introduce Hugh Fung. Hugh Fung is, it's a little, and it's a little special and important to us that she's our last speaker because John Whitmore, um, our recently, um, recently deceased colleague who was just beloved by everybody and a Vietnamese specialist identified her to us in the spring as somebody that we might wanna bring here for a talk. Unfortunately with COVID, she wasn't able to speak, but we were able to bring her in as a lecturer for Southeast Asian Studies 501 this semester. And I'll probably refer to her as Hugh. She's become this um, almost a, a, a fixture in our center. We're all so comfortable with her and her work is so fascinating. We've really enjoyed having her with us this semester. She will remain with us next semester um, teaching another course. Um, she's an environmental historian of Vietnam and a lecturer for us, as well as a visiting scholar at Ohio State University. And she is also a lecturer in history at the University of Hawaii right now. She has her PhD in history from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And she's currently working on her book project. This is called The Production of Water Space, an Environmental History of Early Modern Vietnam. She specializes in the pre-modern period and has done extensive research on documents written in both classical Chinese and Vietnamese Nam script. Her current research is really interesting and something that speaks to us as a center as well because it's so cross-disciplinary. She focuses on the relationship between the environment and state building with a particular interest in the historical agency of water and climate in stimulating social and political change. Um, she has a recent article that's under review that we'll look for the reading when it comes out, Naming the Red River, Becoming a, a Vietnamese River. And that will be in the Journal of Southeast Asian Studies. Um, Hugh has asked that we not take any screenshots. And I'll just like to remind you that all of our presentations when um, the lecture is able to are on YouTube. Um, so with that, uh, Hugh, we're excited to hear your presentation. And thank you for giving it today. All right, um, thank you so much, Laura, for your generous introduction. And uh, thanks to everyone for having me here today, uh, especially those who are staying up late or just got up very early in order to join this seminar. Um, although I can't see all of you, I believe that you are here because you are part of an exciting Southeast Asian studies community 
or probably you are interested in environmental studies with a focus on say Vietnam or the region of Southeast Asia. So let it begins with a simple reflection. What environmental issue will come to your mind when you think about Southeast Asia? Air pollution? Hold on, uh, I'm trying, okay. Air pollution uh, or the shrinking of Southeast Asian forests and the danger to biodiversity. Fish are dammed and energy for industrial revolution. To take you to the talk of uh, to, to the topic of my talk today, drought and ecological culture. I would like us to pause for a moment and think. The environment has been with us for a very long time. Yet, most of environmental issues we often link to Southeast Asia are recent ones. They are discernible to us because we tend to have a detailed documents of those uh, processes or simply because they have occurred at a, an observable velocity. And by that, I mean environmental degradation have occurred so fast that we even experience it within our lifespan. Now, when I first study um, the pre-modern environmental history of Vietnam, the so-called environmental issues weren't discernible in my source. I want to tell you that Vietnamese historical uh, source provide no information of things like a large river that shifted its course or a gigantic volcanic eruption that could wipe out an entire city. What environmental issues that the pre-modern Vietnamese people face? After years of researching, my answers to you is in the title of this talk. Yes, drought. And of course, there were other kind of environmental forces that left their footprint in Vietnamese history. However, I saw you that it was drought that concerned the Vietnamese people the most. So now when you think about drought as a tide of climatic extreme in history, you think it was connected to food production and therefore the instability of society or even the collapse of civilization. So it is often tempting to assume that the increased number of uh, natural disasters like drought would correlate to the rising social political crisis. Yes. What I want to tell you today is a very different picture. And here's what I want you to take away from my talk. My argument is twofold. First, the statistics of recorded drought episodes alone do not reveal the full history associated with drought. Second, the high number of recorded drought episodes does not always correlate with social and political unrest. Indeed, as I saw you, in the case of 15th century Vietnam, unfavorable climate did stimulate social and political change. And I want to emphasize here that we cannot arrive at this conclusion without looking other information beyond the raw 
statistics. The kind of information, the other information that we might find in the historical sources. There were written sources available for pre-modern Vietnam. And over the past years, my research have focused on the periods from around the turn to the 11th century to the late 18th century. The bulk of my work has centered around analyzing environmental related information from the Vietnamese archives. A sort that I've used extensively to analyze natural disasters or especially drought episodes in pre-modern Vietnam was uh, Vietnamese chronicles. Now, as you might know, those uh, dynastic chronicles was compiled uh, in more or less like Chinese dynastic histories. They were all written in classical Chinese because uh, you also uh, know that the Vietnamese didn't turn to Romanized script like we can see in modern Vietnam until the early uh, 20th century. And there are reasons why I focus on this type of source and I would happy to talk to you at length on this point, but let's focus on this, uh, on those chronicles for the moment. When you read those chronicles, you can find the kind of information about, say, the king, the queen, the royal court, many state affairs. Interestingly, we also can find things like drought or other climatic extremes and natural anomalies and things that our modern eyes were no longer able to see, like dragons or things that we no longer feel anxious about, like eclipse. So to give you a sense of how those drought records look like, here's some example. In 1071, it was reported that from spring to summer, no rain. In 4060, it was heavily rainy at nighttime on Guizhou day in the sixth lunar month. And you can see that it's very different culture, different kind of calendar. And especially the historian told us from spring to this night, there had not been any rainfall. And the condition of lacking water persisted centuries later. In 1687, for example, it was not rainy during the 10th lunar month. So as you can see, the fact that those kind of informations have been noted by uh, historians of the past over a millennium means that this kind of phenomena must mean something to the contemporaries. Nature doesn't change overnight. Drought, in fact, always existed in Vietnamese history. Today, along with uh, tropical cyclones and flooding, drought is often cited as a type of natural disasters with the highest frequencies in Vietnam. However, since modern science emerged, drought has become silent in history. And by becoming silent here, I mean that Drought had mainly become the subject of sciences like geology, uh, geography or meteorology. By contrast, historians tend to reduce droughts as part of the physical uh, background um, on which human history have been told or sometimes droughts have been taken for granted as the cause of social and political unrest. I have a good news for you. Historians of Southeast Asia and as well have recently reclaimed drought. And there are two clear incentives. The first thing, the development of paleoclimatology, 
a discipline that studies patterns and cause of past climate change and the spread of environmental analysis into non-US um, histories. So how have a drought and other climate related events been situated in Southeast Asian history? And let me focus on the pre-modern part, which is the, the, uh, the, the period up to around 1850s. The current knowledge we've learned about the impact of drought has come from two major sources, natural archives and written archives. What are natural archives? Simply put, they are natural deposits. Through investigating them, scientists can learn about the condition of past climates. They often include things like sediments, ice cores, tree rings, etc. There are reasons why Southeast Asia, especially the main, mainland part, is a treasure for those who study natural archives. This reason is part of a larger area under the effect of the Asian monsoon system. Now, why scientists have attempted to reach an ag agreement on what they mean when they talk about the Asian monsoon? Then no doubt that this is very, if not the most, important global wind system on Earth. Um, and it affects vast reason of Earth. Now, uh, a quick uh, explanation of how this monsoon system affects mainland Southeast Asia goes like this. In the summer, that is from around May or June to October and November, winds from the ocean carry a lot of rainfall to the mainland. By contrast, during summer uh, winter times, uh, dry air from the Himalayas brings cooler and drier weather in Asia. Both scientists and historians have attempted to synthesize natural and written archives. And among ongoing debates, there seems to be two points of consensus. First, Europe uh, like Europe, mainland Southeast Asia experienced a medieval warm period from around 950 and 1000 to 1250 or uh, 1300. The high precipitation of this period has been uh, attributed to the rise of many classical Chinese, uh, classical states in the reasons. And for uh, many of you here who are familiar with this thesis, you might recognize that uh, the most important historians have uh, promoted this thesis is one of our faculty here in the University of Michigan, Professor Vitor Lieberman. Uh, by contrast, the reason um, has exper uh, experienced a mega drought in the middle of 18th century. And by mega drought, this is a, a kind of period that drought lasts for over several decades. And this uh, mega drought has been confirmed by multiple policy data analysis. So it's also famous connected to um, a wide range of political and social turmoil in the region. Inspired by this kind of research, I turn to Vietnamese archives. And uh, here is my journey to build a data um, of climate related uh, events reported in Vietnamese source. All recently, I wanted to study the 18th century because there were more um, evidence or historical sources of this period than all of other preceding periods. And the late 18th century was also well known for many social political upheavals. 
to understand the climate change impacts, I gather all information related to environment from Vietnamese dynastic histories. And I found that to the Vietnamese people in that period, climate, uh, climatic events such as drought or floods was only part of a wide, wider range of natural anomalies. But to just focus on drought episodes, if you look at this data, you'll see that there was evidence of a mega drought in the later part of the 18th century. And we even can say that this time of period was played with unstable um, events or uh, anomalies of the environment. But what about other periods? In order to know if it's web or whether or not these data showcase a high numbers of unstable uh, environmental events, we need comparison. So I go back to the 15th century. This chart show you similar type of, of, of data or set of information. And for a specific reason, it begins with uh, the year 1434 and end with the year 1504, which is covered around like three quarters of the 15th century. Again, look at the drought episode. There might be slightly fewer reports, but overall, these decades were not free from natural anomalies. Yet, historians of Vietnam uh, for generations have associated this period, the golden age of imperial or dynastic history of Vietnam. So why do we have two very different pictures? The golden age for the 15th century and somehow we got drought associated with social and political unrest in the 18th century. Here, to go back again to my main point, drought didn't simply correlate to social decline. And again, statistics are amazing, but statistics alone couldn't tell us the full pictures of drought history. How did those people, those pre-modern Vietnamese make sense of a drought event? What makes them anxiety? What makes them uh, worried when they have to face a drought event? To answer these questions, I'm analyzing the Vietnamese experience from three dimensions. The first dimension is that the pre-modern people understood drought in a very strong connection to the physical environment with which they interacted. And in this case, it was a wet rice landscape. Second, a historical drought episode must be understood in a specific social and technological context. The 15th century Vietnamese people were concerned with drought because they had embarked on a large scale uh, project of agricultural expansion. Watching nature in general or drought in particular helped achieve this goal. And last, the last dimension was how they perceive uh, nature and uh, other natural anomalies. So let us briefly look at each, these, um, each of these dimensions. How was drought perceived in a strong connection with a particular physical environment of a wet right landscape? Here's a map that show you um, different um, classical states in Southeast Asia prior to the 15th century. And what I mean by 15th century Vietnamese kingdom literally is uh, the lowlands of North uh, and North Central of uh, present day Vietnam. 
drought was a significant um, problem to any pre-industrial uh, farmers or uh, agrarian societies. Uh, and this is particularly true in regard to wet rice um, culture uh, uh, areas because of many factors uh, concerning rice cultivation, water was the most important factor. And this is even more so in the condition of pre-industrial farming. And because water supply for crop basically came from rainfall, it was not the matter of having enough water, but it's the matter of having the water in a timely manner. So to make it happen, the Vietnamese farmers in the pre-modern time need to schedule their rice crops around the pattern of the Asian monsoon. And ideally, they could um, grow two crops. The autumn crops was always more important and I found that a lot of drought reports have been occurs around the beginnings of the summer, a time that was so sensitive for um, rice crops. Moving on to the second dimension, social and technological uh, aspect. Um, We need to understand the drought experience in the social and technological context of this area, this time period, because this was the time that the Vietnamese government embarked in a massive project of agricultural expansion. And we know about this process because there is enough evidence to establish the major transformation of three uh, mechanisms, crop, cropping patterns, dike building, and the adoption of agricultural encouragement policy. Now, to be clear, all of these uh, process, uh, processes had began somewhere before the 15th century, but all of them underwent major transformation in the later part of the 15th century. And to give you an example, we know that in the middle of the uh, 13th century, the Vietnamese governments began to build dikes, large uh, river dikes in order to prevent floods. By the late 15th century, dike building was perceived, was regarded as one of very, very aggressive methods in order to reclaim arable land. This is important because it shows that the government was in a, pro in a process of expansion. And it did so during the time it created uh, great attention to report drought events. Again, the number of drought didn't simply mean social decline. And in addition, to understand the social dimension of drought in the 15th century, it's important for us to compare this with, say, the period preceding it, the 13th and uh, 14th centuries. As I mentioned earlier, Southeast Asian histories uh, historians have described a period of medieval Guam period in the region. And following it is a, a time of transition to the Little Ice Age, where uh, weather, the weather condition turned drier. However, my research of Britain records has shown that the 13th and, uh, the 13th and 14th centuries was probably the wettest period in dynastic history of Vietnam. As we've seen, it was these century, the, the 13th and 14th centuries that the Vietnamese ruler expanded their projects of dike building. They were dealing with the condition of having too much water. 
Therefore, the drier condition of the 15th century was perceived indeed in a context that was contrast to the earlier period. Lastly, cultural belief system. Understanding the way how the pre-modern people perceive drought was one of the most challenging tasks. It, it, it is because we still need to know a lot more about how nature emerged as a modern notion and how the environment or the concept of nature have become somewhat kind of common knowledge in post-colonial Vietnam. Um, for example, by even by the late 19th century, uh, by the late 90s of the 20th century, some scholars when uh, are looking at the drought and other natural anomalous events in uh, dynastic history of Vietnam, they felt the need to remind their readers that, oh yes, there's some kind of bizarre phenomenon there. Um, so most of the time, our scholars of Vietnam have focused mainly on the um, secular aspects of natural disasters uh, and specifically drought. Yes, it's not what uh, the uh, pre-modern people perceive things like drought. Natural was then secular. We know that in medieval uh, Europe, people saw nature as sign. To our imperial China, for example, um, regarding natural anomalies as portents was a very common mental practice. So our Chinese um, historians have famously provided us with us a concept of moral meteorology. That means natures have moral values. When something wrong in the nature, something went wrong in the human realm, especially in the connection with the morality of the standing government. Now, what happened in the late 15th century in Vietnam wasn't the detrust of this kind of belief system or some kind of turn from magic into science. The change occurred and the state found in drought a sort of power. Let's look at quickly three uh, drought episodes and observe what the government did in the past. In 1434, they turned to Buddhism to quest for rain. The Dhamma cloud, a Buddhist deity was invoked this Buddhist goddess have been well known for providing the Vietnamese with the needed powerful rainfall. Yet it's not, it wasn't enough. The drought continued pressing the government. Because of the drought, some people began or uh, started to question the ruler's virtue. That person was killed. But the killing of that person um, then was used to explain by that by killing pet people, the rain eventually came. 1449, the kingdom again experienced drought. The royal courts first performed certain kind of ceremony in, in their royal palace uh, located in the current day uh, uh, Hanoi, uh, to ask for certain Taoist deity. They then sent officials to pray to sacred mountains in the area. But what really, really significant that year was finally the king issued a South reproach decrees. The historians told us it rained during the night of the very day when this degree was issued. And this is a kind of issue in that the king would claim the coming of rainfall was only the business between the king and 
the sky god or nature. By the end of 15th century, whenever a drought was reported, most of the time we could see the king simply issues a south reproach decrease. In this way, the king exploited the notion that nature carry moral values. If people worry about the drought and the king can't directly connect to the God in the matter of the drought. And it is the king who have the most powerful source in order to control the crisis in the kingdom. So here from the composition between the current king and the God, we can hear, I be so little virtue, I beg you sky God to forgive my wrongdoing so that the rain will come down. So in considering all of these three dimensions of drought experience, I've shown that the full historical uh, history of drought isn't limited to the statistics that reflect how many droughts at Paiso have been recorded. Certainly, these environmental related um, records tell us something about the conditions of past climate. Because timely rainfall was the most important issues for pre-industrial um, farmers, climatic events like um, droughts, storm rains, um, Floods were frequently noted by uh, the historians of the past, but the higher numbers of um, the record, recorded drought episodes and other natural anomalies could have a different implication in different contexts. So in the case of 15th century Vietnam, the drought records did not speak to societal decline, but agricultural expansion. Hence, if we are to treat historical records as one type of process to understand the condition of past climate, my argument is that we need to study it carefully and thoroughly before we merging it with other instrumental data. And being creative with pre-modern materials is both challenging and rewarding. So now it is the time to turn to the other part of uh, the title of my talk. What kind of ecological culture do we need? The statistics are useful. Um, quantitative information is no doubt important, but to understand the environmental episodes like a drought, we are asked to dig deeper. That is a drought episode needed to be understood to um, the combination of things like uh, how people interacted with their physical environment, what kind of social and technological structure they living in, and what were their cultural perspective of nature and other natural anomalies. So as an aspect of the environment, Drought was experienced by all people in the 15th century. And as you have seen, uh, many social aspects uh, of the 15th century have been uh, organized around uh, events like drought and other water related environmental phenomena. We are today dealing with many global environmental issues. So if we are to agree that to solve those issues, we need to go global, international. I would like to leave with you an open question, an open calling for thinking about how to build a genuinely global cultures of ecology. So what's next? As you might know, the research presented in this talk is part of my ongoing book projects. So my ultimate goal in um, joining this seminar is to share with you an innovative way to read the pre-modern history of Vietnam 
uh, I hope that I can learn a lot more from you uh, on the topic uh, as you might work in other uh, fields like uh, either Southeast Asian um, history, uh, pre-modern history, or uh, the pre-modern history of uh, other parts of the world. Um, another world I would like to uh, uh, state here is that I want to reach out to those of you who are interested in the study of paleoclimate, of uh, the environmental condition in the past or environmental changes. I look forward to having future collaborations with all of you. Before turning to our Q&A uh, discussion, uh, I would like to thank the Central for Southeast Asian Studies and other units of the University of Michigan uh, that uh, have organized and sponsored this seminar, and especially thanks to uh, Laura and other staff, Jessica, um, who helped me a lot uh, during the time of preparing for this talk. And big thanks to all of you for taking the time to be with me today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fong. We're, that was really interesting and informative talk. Um, so we're going to start the Q&A session now. Um, please feel free to type into the Q&A. Um, if you can say your name and your affiliation, that would be great. Um, so first we have a question from Thomas Wagner. Did agricultural expansion proceed or result in significant population increases? And did drought result in population migrations within the country? Um, thank you so much for, for this question. So um, for population migration, now population is really quite a difficult uh, topic to study in uh, uh, the early uh, period, like the 15th century. I have to say that Within my research, I have no answer, direct answer for you, but I'm aware that in the field of Vietnamese studies, there has been an argument to say that uh, the transformation from the, say, 13th, 14th uh, century to the 15th century related to the migrations of uh, the population from the eastern uh, wait, yes, the Eastern Delta of the Red River to the Western Delta, and I know that is quite like a specific. Uh, so I, I'm really happy to talk to you like in uh, email or later on this. Uh, but uh, I also noticed the second question. Should I just answer right away? Uh, the question? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because uh, it's come again uh, this, uh, from uh, Thomas. Did droughts per change from wet rye production to other type of crops. And uh, it is really, really interesting uh, kind of research. And I try to uh, understand this uh, as well. But one thing I, I want to um, emphasize here, which I didn't really uh, have a time to uh, develop in my talk, is that even within wet rice production, uh, we most of the time we kind of take for granted that uh, throughout the um, uh, pre-modern time, uh, the people uh, always uh, was happily to grow to crops during the years. Uh, my research tried to show that actually the ability to do some kind of two crops, the autumn and the summer, was actually happened around the 15th century because of a lot of factors. Uh, but how about other crops? What is interesting because actually it happened a little bit later, not the 15th century. It's around like the late 16th century and early 17th century when the new world crops was introduced in Vietnam, like uh, 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 corn or uh, uh, potatoes. And uh, I, I think, you know, at the levels of, of the farmers, uh, it's just like everywhere, of course, if for the food, uh, for the need for food, probably in the garden, they would grow other type of crops. But because of the cultures, because of the government's tax system based on rice grain, so um, very interestingly in Vietnam, wet rice 
um, maintained as even kind of monocrops until the 19th century. And uh, one of the things we, we want to appreciate um, uh, the pre-modern experience that it's not that like, it's very easy, like we, we, we're thinking about uh, why uh, grow potato is easier, why people just switch to eat potatoes, because for centuries when people eat rice, not only that they, they familiar with the taste, but also a lot of uh, um, uh, culture and uh, religious, like for example, if you pray for their ancestor, you need rice instead of potato. So for that, there is not just uh, uh, the environment uh, that can impose the factors on how the crops um, uh, would uh, change. But yes, uh, if we want to know whether or not drought would affect that, I think it's we have to look for the 16th and the 17th century. Great, thanks. Um, I have a question, but I'll ask you later. Um, that's, no, that was, that was interesting. So Margaret Bodnemer um, from History at Cal Poly asked, you mentioned it's difficult to know the cultural outlook of early peoples with regard to nature. How can you find out more about that? Um, the reasons why I said it is difficult because um, there, there are reasons for Vietnam and also the Vietnamese studies. And there are also reasons related to the way actually how uh, we as scholars have been changed. So the first thing is that when you study Vietnam, most of the time, and if you do pre-modern Vietnam, of course, you're gonna have to uh, like dig deeper in Chinese history. And Chinese mm -hmm. history was massive. And there was time I really tried to understand like, uh, oh, uh, when people think about nature, whether or not they, they, they took the elements from say Buddhism or, or Taoism or Confucianism, that sort of thing. Uh, but even when you think that, oh, that kind of uh, ideology very similar to Confucianism in China, then the problem is that Confucianism in China has also changed over thousands of years. So uh, to in order to know what kind of Confucian ideas that was introduced in Vietnamese were difficult. So it is the, my ongoing projects on that. The second problem with, uh, with, with understanding this because it actually have problem with colonialism colonialization that we still have stuck with the ideas that, you know, a lot of things happened in Asia was backward, uh, traditional was superstitious, that sort of stuff. But actually a, a lot of, we, we should learn a lot of parallels happened in say middle Europe and in, uh, in, in some way in Vietnam. And also like if you do Vietnamese history, you didn't really have a luxury to actually spend time a lot to study China or other parts of the world. So uh, in order to understand the cultural outlooks of the early people, they really uh, need courage and more support for people from different areas to come together. And also I want to add the indigenous studies. So I used to try to reach out to indigenous studies people, but not necessarily people gonna respond right away. So, but it's actually the, the topic is, and the, the problem to study is very similar. Great, uh, Zach Loprich from Albion College is asking when, so how far back do you find the first formal or thorough study or research done on climate and flooding in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. So how far back do these research go? Um, let me uh, think for a moment because I'm not quite sure if you mentioned, um, uh, Jack, I, I'm not quite sure if you mentioned like former here means like uh, secondary sources, the studies of scholars, uh, on that, if it is the case that like what people in Southeast Asia and Vietnam have done, um, I'm not sure about Southeast Asia, but in Vietnam, I don't think people have done it before. Uh, people was aware of um, uh, things like climate and flooding, but uh, the kind of resource I'm, I'm doing, I mean, I hope that someone did it before, but the mm -hmm. kind of research I'm doing actually it's quite, uh, uh, um, pioneering, I would say. Mm -hmm. So it is really, really tough, actually, because uh, I'm very nervous for a lot of things that I uh, played out. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it needs to be done. 
Yeah, but uh, Jack, if I didn't answer your question, please uh, feel free to uh, get in touch in email uh, and uh, we can talk more on that. Thank you. So Eric White from here at Michigan. Hi, Eric. Um, ask, could you expand upon and clarify what type of strategies and techniques beyond royal religious rituals the Vietnamese employed in the 15th century when responding to drought? And to what degree were these responses organized by state elites versus local communities? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, uh, thanks, Eric. Um, yes, uh, indeed, indeed. Um, part of my research did uh, touch up and on um, how to, um, beyond the re uh, religious rituals, and it is mainly part that actually I touch a little bit in my in my talk about the mechanism of agricultural expansion, how uh, the government have a certain policy to promote uh, double crop or a uh, uh, dike building or uh, the kind of like um, uh, uh, agriculture uh, development. Now, I have to admit that because it's the 15th century and most of uh, the materials I'm working is so limited in written sources. So it is really elite based. I have very little uh, understanding about uh, local communities. Now, I didn't try to claim that we don't have any information from local community, but I have to say that to study the, the, the uh, um, uh, primary sources of, of, of uh, um, pre-modern Vietnam is quite complicated. It's very messy and, and you really start with like learn how to read the documents first. Uh, so I believe that we can do it at the local communities and I also uh, wanted to do that, but but studying the local community through the, the perspective of the state government, I did have this, uh, some certain information, for example, like how certain um, uh, law that imposed by the government and the uh, discussion, say, for example, uh, in the late 15th century, one of the um, uh, officials from an area that was uh, favorable for developed uh, summer crops did actually protest the government say that okay here in our area we actually focus on the summer course that means we have to start to prepare the field around like uh, December January and the government generally to recruit people for like uh, public uh, work during that period of time because the other part of the kingdom focus on the autumn crops so this was the time we saw the protest for the second crop. So it is a how I can see certain kind of local communities. And actually one of part of my, my research, I'm really trying to showcase that um, the transformation and the effect of drought actually uh, were different even within the Vietnamese kingdom and the area, the lower uh, uh, Red River actually was a newer development in the late 15th century. And there are a lot of going on in that area. Okay, Professor Philip Brown from Ohio State History. Um, thank you for an interesting presentation. And I'm interested in this too. Interested to know more about the state of scientific paleoclimatic research in Vietnam. For example, is a dendrological work very common? Pollen analysis and soil cores. Is there good continuity in these types of data? Okay, th thank you. Thank you, Professor Brown, for your uh, questions. Now, uh, I have to say that I'm not, uh, it is my phone that I haven't really worked uh, very closely with uh, climate uh, his, uh, scientists, but I know that there weren't um, uh, one professors in uh, Columbia University was the kind of pioneering and in, in study that kind of uh, inv uh, information of Southeast Asia. Now, still, there are a couple issues. One is that they have a certain kind of uh, data for tree rings, most of the time tree rings. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, I now I have to say that this kind of uh, information just update very fast. So I would say about uh, some like two years ago, by the time my 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 kind of research set at this uh, moment, um, the finding is basically three main sites for triggering process. One in the uh, border between uh, 
Myanmar in Thailand and one in Southern Vietnam and one in Northern Vietnam. Um, all of those uh, proxy data, the problem with that is that uh, we can use that at some certain point, but most of uh, scientists and even historians like uh, Vital Lieberman what really wonders that the uh, accuracy of these data didn't go further back before the 18th century. So if you do 18th century, you you have a good chance. Earlier than that, you really can have to be skeptical about the pattern profile on that. But I think like we, we have a potential to continue to have a more newer information. And in my way uh, of uh, trying to figure out how to uh, merge the written records with those uh, data, I really try to think hard, not just like, okay, there are five records uh, of drought reported in the 15th century. I try to understand how the nature of the, 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 the events uh, connected with like in one year they have a drought and also flood and what time of the year that those report was. And it's really, really a lot of research, but it is a way to go and there's a lot we can do on that. It sounds like it's pretty dynamic. The, the yes. research for the climate, it's very dynamic research. Okay. Um, Theo Cypress, who's our friend from the Midwest Institute. Hi, Theo. Asked how your research is influenced by differences in regional climatic changes, such as North versus South Vietnam and droughts. Uh, thank you, Cybrid. Um, so, North and South Vietnam is something we're going to talk about in the later part of uh, Vietnamese history. So, I actually um, need to emphasize more and in my uh my book projects i actually spent an entire chapter explained how the uh concept of vietnamese space was set over the time so most of the thing that we're talking about here is talking about basically northern part of vietnam but even when you talk about northern part of vietnam don't have a, that kind of image that you are familiar with in in the modern map and one of the thing i try to understand is how uh the peoples in the royal court make connection with with other parts both in the lowland and the mountainous areas. So it's not just like if they claim that their kingdom uh, uh, cover the entire northern and north central part of Vietnam, it means that they have a control in all of the areas because we know that in a lot of areas like a forest and mountainous area, there are other type of people just around there. So um, yes, I uh, at this moment, uh, uh, I uh, my research only focus on, on on that part. But I really, really hope that we can uh, find more people who like uh, uh, specialize in Cham history or mm -hmm. southern part, in in order to make more thorough analysis of of, of, of this. Yes. And I have to apologize. It's one o'clock, and there's a number of questions which I'll pass on to you, Hugh, if you want to type in answers or anything as we go. But I did want to thank um, everybody for the a really nice dynamic discussion and thank Dr. Fung for coming and talking to us and giving us such an interesting talk. And um, since it's so odd that we usually we have an end of the year celebration, but just wanted to wish everybody a safe and happy holiday and to definitely look, look us up, see us virtually in January and we hope to see you in person very, very soon. So thank you so much again for today. And again, I'll pass on, um, Hugh will be able to take a look at your questions after the seminar as well and feel free to contact her. Thank you so much.